to see you this morning. We are continuing our introduction to the book of Revelation. And we have, um, I don't know how many weeks it's been now, it's been uh, several. And uh, a book well introduced is a book what? Well, all right. Do you believe it? Yeah. Maybe not, but hopefully soon. A book well introduced is a book half taught. There are many things that we've discussed in the book of Revelation or about the book of Revelation. Can you name some things in the last few weeks that we have emphasized about approaches or anything to do with introduction to the book of Revelation? And we'll just take all those comments as we go. What do you know? How have we laid the foundation? It is possible to understand it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's probably the most important one. It is, it is possible to understand this book. Uh, I, I don't know how many times people have neglected the book because of the difficulty to understand it. You, you know, there's an interesting paradox here in the book of Revelation. It's probably the most neglected, the least understood book. But those who have not really indulged in a detailed study of the Bible, guess where they want to go first? Is that not interesting? They want to know about Revelation. But yes, this book, and I think we have laid that foundation, can be understood. Why is it mainly misunderstood? Yes, the symbolism that's in the book. Our minds, we're not used to communicating this way. We, we don't typically do this. And so there's a lot of imagery. There is a lot of figures, figurative language that we have to get used to. And yes, next week or the week after we will be handing out a glossary of all of the symbols in the book of Revelation and an interpretation to this book that I believe is in, in good correlation with the rest of the Bible. And isn't that a, a necessary hermeneutical principle? What does the word hermeneutics mean? Yes. The method of interpretation, simply. It, it's, a, it's a long word with a very simple meaning. Hermeneutics is not necessarily a spiritual or a biblical word. But when it's applied to the Bible, it means the science. What is a science in contrast to an art? What is a science? True facts. True facts. Truth. Something that's absolute. When a, a scientist is in his laboratory, he is interpreting facts. He comes up with a hypothesis. He proves that, but he has to see those facts in a test tube. We are not going to be saved by the Lord by experiencing him through the empirical senses. Seeing him. Touching him. A lot of religious people believe that. Oh, the Lord spoke to me last night on my bed. Or, or I saw a vision of the Lord. I, I, I saw him. Remember, Thomas needed that verification when he said, Unless I put my hands in the prince, in his hands, and his, I won't believe. Jesus says, Thomas, because you've seen, you believe. More blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. That's what we call faith. Not any less real. Right? How many believe that uh, George Washington existed? Have you shook his hand? Have you experienced him through the five empirical senses? No. You accept George Washington by faith. You get all of the evidence, and you're ready to debate with anybody that a man by the name of George Washington founded this country and existed. It's the same way with the God of heaven. We've got to understand this. John is where when he is penning this book? Patmos. Patmos. Why was he there? Yes, he was in exile. Who put him there? 
some have read ahead and studied the approach to this book, and some say Domitian. I believe that that's correct. We'll see in a few weeks if it's Domitian or not. But the Roman emperor exiled, and, and by the way, this is another interesting fact that I think proves the late date of the book of Revelation, is that Nero and his contemporaries did not use exile as a means of punishment. That did not come into vogue until Domitian in the later part of the first century. Keep that in the back of your mind. We'll need that. We'll need that tidbit later. But John is in exile and he's trying to get a message to the Christians who were suffering persecution, but he was trying to keep that message from the Romans because he didn't need any more attention than he already got. In fact, the Lord in his good providence probably thought it good as he did with the Apostle Paul in putting him uh, in prison, allowing him to go in order that he could be busily engaged in writing your New Testament. And so John is in a type of prison, imprisonment that we're calling exile here on the Isle of Patmos. And where was Patmos located? Off the tip of Asia Minor. Okay, it is off of Asia Minor. Okay, it's about 70 miles south of Ephesus. One of the seven churches that will be addressed here in the opening and the beginning of the book. All right, then we must sit with John on the Isle of Patmos. And we've got to understand, you have glasses on? Who has glasses on? Would you take them off for just a moment? Do you have contacts in? I guess it's not going to be expedient to ask you to take your contacts out, will it? But we're going to get rid of our eyewear just for the next 40 minutes or so. We're going to put them aside, and we're going to get out our first century. Do we need to call them spectacles? Is that what they call them? We're going to make a spectacle of this class. And put on our first century spectacles and go with John to the Isle of Patmos and see the historical context, but not only that, understand what the intent of John was to those to whom he initially wrote. And unless we get that, oh, are we going to make a mess out of this book? And so it is with any book of the New Testament. We go to Patmos first in the first century, very late first century, I believe. And then we go to each individual church in chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches. And then we go to Woodstock. Oh, so many. Take this book, and instead of following that map, they want to take it to their place first. And they read Adolf Hitler in the book of Revelation, and they read Mussolini, and they read fill in the blank, and on and on and on and on and on it goes. To where this book is such a confused mess that no wonder people have rushed to the conclusion. We can't understand this book. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Is revelation truth? Yes. Then what's our conclusion? It can be understood. The book of Revelation does not have a lot of deep concepts in it. It is not a difficult to understand book from that perspective. It's all about language. It's all about communication. It's all this is. And we can get it done. Revelation, and, and please understand there's no S on the end of that word. It is one revelation repeated in cycles. It's a cyclical kind of uh, idea repeated seven times 
in different figures. You know, it's kind of like, um, have you ever known someone to call the first four books of the New Testament the Gospels? It's not right. There's only one. It's four different accounts of the Gospel. The Gospel accounts is much more accurate, not the Gospels. The book of Revelation teaches us what? How many, how many Gospels are there? There's one. And that gospel was once and for all delivered unto the saints, interestingly enough again, in the book of Jude at the end of the first century. So we are not looking at revelations. We're looking at one revelation that John is being permitted to see. And John is the audience as he's looking at, remember the picture that, uh, that Reagan brought back of the of the. Of the the uh, imprisonment that John was in, in in Patmos and how he was looking out that that uh, hole that was etched in the rock. John is the audience here and he's seeing a panoramic view. He's watching a play. John is literally seeing a non-literal play unfold before his eyes. John is not in heaven, Right? How do I know that John is not in heaven as he pens this? He says he lives in Patmos. <laughs> right? He's in Patmos. He's not in Patmos and in heaven. His spirit has not left his body yet. He's not in heaven. He's seeing a vision. This was being, if you will, signified. We would call that signified. What does that mean? He was being shown signs. He was being shown a play. When you go see a play, right? You go to the Fox Theater and you're watching a play. You're watching a depiction, perhaps if it's a play of Shakespeare. You are watching a play of events that transpired years ago. It was written years ago. It took place in, 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 in somewhere years ago. You're seeing a play. This is what John is saying in Patmos. Okay? And he's seeing it in signs. That's going to be so important as we open the chapter. But this, yes. Yeah, I want to add to that. We have to remember that he didn't sit and watch this play and then record it afterwards. He was recording what he saw and he saw. Yes. Was, there was no real understanding of the end results as he was penning this. He was just a recorder. And so it is with uh, things that the apostles wrote and spoke. Did Peter really understand this idea of the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile being battered down? No. He sinned many times after Acts chapter 2 because he was a racist. Because an apostle spoke or wrote inerrantly doesn't mean that they applied those things that they spoke or wrote inerrantly. These things were given to them. They didn't have to study and ponder these things as we do when we accept the truth. It was given to them directly, miraculously, so they wrote it or spoke it inerrantly. But that's a far cry, John from them understanding it to the point where they applied it perfectly in their daily lives. So when they taught or wrote, they could, in a sense, feel what we feel to a large degree. Well, when we look at the book of Revelation, it's going to mirror some things. And it's going to mirror conflicts. Number one, it's going to mirror God and the devil. Okay, there's going to be this war. What's the great war in the book of Revelation? What is it called? Armageddon. Armageddon. Have you heard of the battle of Armageddon? Just to show how important the approach to this book is, and we're going to get into the approaches today, and that's our last major point of our introduction. So if we get through it today, we will start text next Sunday. 
If we don't get through it today, we'll finish it and start the next half of the year. The futuristic approach to the book of Revelation says this. The kingdom is not here. The church has been established in the place of the kingdom. They're not one and the same. The kingdom is going to be established when the Lord returns again. The 70 weeks of Daniel has a parenthetical stop in it. We're in the midst of that stop now because the Jews rejected Christ when he came the first time. And so instead of establishing the kingdom which he intended, he, ex he established something that's not quite as significant in the, as the kingdom. And it's a temporary thing, not in the eternal purpose of God and not really to, to last very long. And it's this thing, and in fact, it can even get so insignificant, you can choose the one of your choice. And this entity is called the church. In the mind of the futuristic approach to the book of Revelation, no big deal. No big deal at all. You just get ready for the kingdom. That's the bigger deal. And in previous weeks, we have looked at Scripture and we have seen what the Bible says about the kingdom and how it's prophesied, how it was in God's eternal mind, how the church and the kingdom are one and the same. If you're in the church, you're in the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom, you're in the church. God is now, Jesus Christ, God is now ruling over the kingdom. Listen to me. If there is no kingdom, there is no king. You can't have a kingdom without a king. You can't have a king without a kingdom. They go one in, uh, hand in hand. So if the kingdom is not here yet, why are they talking about King Jesus? The futuristic approach says this, particularly in chapters 4 through 19, and in some sections of 20 through 22, these things are all yet future. All are yet future. And if all these things are yet future, what in the world would the message of Revelation have to do with its initial recipients? Can you imagine telling the first century recipients that the great beast was Adolf Hitler? You've got to be kidding. Now, after we take our 21st century uh, I wear off and we go back to the first century and we come through. Could there be some application to the times of Hitler? Absolutely. Or to our time? Absolutely. The principles still apply. But the initial recipients would not be concerned one iota about some of these far-fetched futuristic Approaches to the book of Revelation. It's a great conflict between God and evil. Do those things still happen today? Oh, absolutely. God and the devil. There's, a, there's an idea of the conflict between the church and Rome of the latter first century and the second century. That's the initial context. That, that, was the, that was the Armageddon that was happening at that day. And there has been Armageddon. There has been not a physical warfare between God, his people, and Satan and his people. But it's been a spiritual warfare where the people of God do not take up arms. As per the Crusades. But their warfare is with the mind, for the mind of man. You see, that's what Christianity is about. It's not a modern behavioral modification approach to converting people, but it's from the inside out. God wants the heart first. And so this battle is a spiritual battle that has been taking place from the cross till this very moment. 
The battle of Armageddon is being fought now. It's not going to be fought in a little area over in the Middle East. And every political policy needs to be support Jerusalem for the end time spiritual good. The faithful student of the Bible rejects that idea. Now, I know that this is like a voice crying in the wilderness in many religious circles. I, I, I understand that. But be that as it may, that approach to the book of Revelation tries to make a square fit into a round hole. It doesn't work. Too many, and this is another rule important rule of, the, uh, of, her, of hermeneutics. You always interpret a figurative, less obscure passage in light of objective, clear passages of truth. And what we've seen about the kingdom thus far are clear, are sure, are literal, are understandable, and so, a highly figurative passage or book is translated or is determined in light of what is known, not the other way around. That's why we don't go to the book of Revelation first. That's why we don't go to the book of Ezekiel first. That's why we don't go to the book of Zechariah first. That's why we don't go to the end of the book of Daniel first. All we get there, but not first. We know what is sure and without doubt. And then if our interpretation of, of, of more obscure passages contradict what is absolutely known, then we know that our interpretation of the book of Revelation is faulty. And that's why this futuristic method of the book of Revelation is so, so faulty. Too much of scripture is contradicted by this futuristic method. And so, what kicks this method off, and I guess we can start with this first approach to the book of Revelation, and we'll call it, we'll call it the uh, futuristic approach. But what it does is it takes these great conflicts between God and the devil, between the church and the first century persecutor, which was Rome, it takes, it, it shows a picture of the battle between monotheism and polytheism. Monotheism, one. Polytheism, many. The idea of one God and many gods. Emperor worship was a problem in the first century. Again, more of a problem later first century. When, they, when the emperor started demanding worship as God. You see. And there's this great conflict in this battle of Armageddon between monotheism and polytheism. There was a, there's a great mirror of the image between good and evil. <laughs> the life and death struggle with all of these foes, but... The church is victorious. That's the main thing. And so as we apply these principles of the first century and to their persecutor Rome, then we apply, then we start to put back on our 21st century glasses in Woodstock, Georgia, and we look at these principles as they apply today, not taking each individual image and detail and applying it to today. That's the main problem with the approach to the book of Revelation today. And in doing so, the kingdom idea is messed up. The church idea is messed up. These battles are messed up. And they're giving people another chance when the Lord comes back. Because when the Lord comes back, it all is going to start. Well, before he actually comes back, it's all going to start with the rapture which is not a biblical concept at all. Made up in the mind of man, promoted in the late 1800s by the name of John Darby, 
Believe me, this idea is a very, relatively speaking, a very Johnny-come-lately kind of idea. You know, you've seen the bumper stickers about if this car is left driverless, you know, it's, watch out, you know, it's the rapture. Well, as we go in and we delve in more deeply to the book of Revelation, we're going to see the rupture of the rapture. <laughs> it's not there. It's not there. And so there is going to be this time, and it's, it's going to be, a, well, the first three and a half years is going to be something that's going to be followed by the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation. You know, there's been great tribulations ever since the cross. The cross was a great tribulation. Just like there have been many battles of Armageddon being fought. We're fighting individual battles of Armageddon, aren't we? We do that in our lives. So it is with all of this. You know, the idea of rapture, just generally speaking, is that a biblical concept? Yeah, it is. Isn't it? What does rapture mean? What, it just simply means what? Yeah, taken up. Taken up. When the Lord comes back again, there's going to be a rapture, right? Those of us, the, the, the dead in Christ, will what first? Rapture. There's your rapture. There's your rapture. Those of us that are alive and remain, speaking of the faithful, will be what? Caught up, and we're going to meet who? Jesus, Jesus and who? Yeah. Is Jesus the only one we're going to meet in the air? No, we're going to meet a lot of other people in the air. Who are we going to meet? Yeah, we're going to meet the Christians. Where are they right now? Are they in heaven? No, where are they? Paradise. Let's take a real uh, simplistic, humanistic approach to this. Jesus is in heaven, right? Is that where he is right now? Is he on the, where, where is he in heaven, by the way? Here's another um, loophole that the futurist, and when I, when I say a futurist, I am basically referring to a premillennialist. The ones that believe that Christ is literally coming to the earth, going to reign a thousand years on the earth, and all of these things will trans, uh, transpire. Where is Jesus now in heaven? He's at the right hand of, uh, of, of God, and he's, he's sitting somewhere. Do you remember where he's sitting? He's on a throne. He's on a throne. Now, whose throne is that? David's throne? He's on David's throne now? Well, he's got to be on the throne now because... Wait a minute. If he's king now, he's got to be on a throne somewhere, and he's got to have a kingdom. But we're told, according to this verse, or this uh, approach, that the kingdom's yet future... But the Bible also says he's on David's throne. Where's David? Where is David? Good question. Where is David now? Yeah, he's in paradise too. He's in paradise too. But his throne, the Bible tells us, is in heaven. It's not in Jerusalem. In fact, a very clear passage of scripture that we looked at last week from the prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 22 that there will be no one, no one of the line of Jeconiah, the next to the last king of Judah, will prosper anymore sitting on David's throne, period. Sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem. So the Lord cannot be king of kings and lord of lords sitting on David's literal throne in Jerusalem. <laughs> oh, he's on David's throne, but not on this earth. So when the, when the time comes, Jesus is going to leave heaven. Now, this is, a, this is a, a limited approach through our thinking. Jesus is going to stop off, if you will, at paradise. He's going to stop off at paradise. And you know the loved ones that we want to see again that have uh, left us recently and, and in years that we long to see again? Guess when we're going to see them for the first time, not a judgment. Don't you wish that 
noon today. Don't you wish he'd say it right now? And, and, and what would it be like, you know, the, the roof of the building might, because every eye is going to see him. And the first Thessalonian letter says that, that every eye will see him and that he's going to be coming. And this is huge. He's going to be coming with his saints. And then we which are alive and remain, if I may use this word, are going to be raptured up, are going to be taken up. And we're going to meet them in the air. Now watch this. And so in that manner, in that way, we will ever be with the Lord. The Bible never says that the Lord's ever going to step foot on this earth again, let alone fight a battle in Armageddon. But there's this idea in the book of Revelation that mirrors this life struggles. But the victory is ours, and we're going to see God and the loved ones. Yes, I see hands. I don't I don't hear bells well, and sometimes I don't see hands well either. Who's first? Go ahead. I was just getting back to your clear interpretation of the passage passages. How do people that believe that rectify what Jesus said? My kingdom is not the world. Oh yeah. Remember Walter's referencing what Jesus said before Pilate, when Pilate sarcastically asked, well, what is truth? He wasn't interested in truth. He thought Jesus was a crank. He didn't know anything about truth. He didn't want to know anything about truth. But anyway, Jesus responded by saying, Listen, Pilate, whatever you have, you've been allowed that by God. My kingdom is not of this world. That, that, that's an interesting phrase. What does he mean by that? He doesn't mean that the kingdom not in the world. It's not of the world. It's in it. But it's not a physical one. And he explains that when he said, if it were of this world, then would my servants what? But this whole approach to the book of Revelation says one day we're going, Jesus is going to literally mount a white horse. You and I are going to take up arms, even though Jesus would say when the apostles tried to do that in the garden, Peter put up what? Put up your sword. That's, we're not going for a, he wanted a physical kingdom. The apostles, remember the mom of James and John, Lord. Put James and John at your right hand in the kingdom. She wasn't thinking about the church. She thought that they were going to throw off the yoke and bondage of Rome. And the Jews were going to be restored to their glory in the time of David and Solomon. And that's all the apostles could seemingly grasp. Even during the whole ministry of Jesus. And when he turns and drops dime on them and tells them, hey, I'm leaving... It's like, okay. And that was the idea that Jesus was trying to get across to Thomas. Thomas wanted it all physical too. And so the premillennialist makes the same mistake that the first century Jew made. They're trying desperately to get a physical kingdom out of all this mess. And by so doing, they are deceiving many, 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 many people. Now, it makes for a wonderful story, doesn't it? Oh, we could talk about, we could literalize this book, and we could make it into whatever you want to make it into. And we can try to fit it in a neat little package if we weren't really concerned about putting Revelation in its context and we were more enthralled with a neat story than we would be how it really correlates with prophecy. Oh, we could do that. But what good would we be at the end of all that? The book of Revelation mirrors these kinds of things. This life, life and death struggle that has been characteristic of God's people from the very, very beginning. All right. The futuristic. Sometimes it's called the eschatological 
view. Eschatology. That's another big word that just means something very simple. End times. So if you read the word eschatology in the commentaries that you are looking at, that's all that that means. The end times. So sometimes this futuristic approach relating to the end times is not only called the futuristic approach or the futuristic method to the book of Revelation, but uh, eschatological is also used. And so uh, as we said, for the most part, chapters 4 and after describe events in the mind of the futurist that is yet the future. Uh, dispensationalists. Now let's let's get a, a good solid understanding about what a dispensationalist is. I'm a dispensationalist. Generally speaking, a dispensation is what? A period or an epoch of time. Right? I've heard you speak about the patriarchal what? Dispensation. I've heard you talk about the mosaic what? Dispensation. I've heard you talk about the Christian age or dispensation. We are dispensationalists according to one line of thought. And we are rapturists, right? According to one line of thought. We're going to be raptured up. But we don't believe in the doctrine of the rapture. And we don't believe, though, and the Bible does not teach, in dispensationalism. Now, in dispensationalism, which is a subset of premillennialism, which is a subset of the futuristic approach to the book of Revelation. The dispensationalist says there are not three, as you and I would, would believe, but there are seven. Now, that's, an, that's interesting, isn't it? That's a prominent number in the book of Revelation, isn't it? What does, what does the number seven mean in figurative language? Yeah. What does seven mean in literal language? It's seven. It's axiomatic, right? It's seven. Seven, seven, seven. In figurative language, it means complete. So, and by the way, I don't know that I've ever met a futurist a premillennialist, a dispensationalist, who is consistent in what they take literally and figuratively from the book of Revelation. I've, I don't believe I've seen that one yet. Maybe I will. I don't know. But I know that that approach will contradict other clear passages. Every time. Every time. So the dispensationalist takes the book of Revelation and they then, and this is another category of an approach to the book of Revelation altogether, but sometimes the dispensationalists will borrow it. It's called continuous historical. Many members of the church believe this about the book of Revelation. I believe those many members of the church are not right for lots of reasons. But what they'll do, the continuous historical... Now, don't hear that as just historical. There's some historical things in the book of Revelation. But what they're saying is, is you start with chapter 4. In the minds of most people, Revelation begins in chapter 4. Okay? Because the uh, chapters 2 and 3, are, we're good to go there. You know, writing the seven churches of Asia, and John is talking about the good things and the bad things about those churches. We, we, we can get that. It's chapter 4 where it, all, where, where, the, where it all really starts in the minds of the people. And so what they believe is that chapter 4, depending on what subset of the continuous historical approach you're part of, will depend on where that starts in history. And as you read the book of Revelation, it continues down through time in those years. And you get down further to into the book of Revelation, and you come down to the 20th century, and you come to Hitler and all that. It's a continuous idea that God is revealing to John this history as it goes in order. That'd be kind of neat if God did that, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be a neat history to read? 
And, and, and to be able to say, oh, this time period, yeah, here was the Dark Ages, and that's what this part of Revelation talks about. And here is uh, World War II, and that's what this part of Revelation is talking about. And here is our day, and this is what applies. That would make for a fascinating reading, wouldn't it? We could have that approach if we wanted it. But there's one big sticking point with all that. God didn't do it that way either. And how do we know that God didn't do that that way? Because that approach, as we will see, contradicts many clear passages of Scripture. And that approach isn't going to take care of the questions that the initial recipients asked. I hear some talking back here. Did I miss a bell? Okay. All right. I want to look lastly today. Next week, hopefully we'll finish the other. There are four approaches, by the way, generally speaking. If you're not counting some subset approach, but generally four approaches to the book of Revelation, we'll finish that quickly next week. And then we will hand out. I know you've been asking, when is it, when is it coming? It looks like it's coming next week. Next Sunday is today. We'll get those out and we'll get into the text. But I want us to see one last point. Yes, sir. Uh, add note to the continuous history. Jesus Christ is the one that's leading John through this. And in his teachings, when he was with his apostles, how many times did he teach them the same point over and over in different ways? Yeah. And that's exactly what he's doing here. That's right. That's exactly Repetition. And that's the thing about the whole Bible. The whole book of the Bible is Deuteronomy. What's Deuteronomy mean? What's Deutero mean? Second? Two? Namas means what? The Greek law. Deuteronomy was the second beginning of the law. As I said before, so say I now again. Times have you heard that? As I've said before, now I say again. You know, people look at the Bible and say, how can I understand that? You know what? There is so much repetition in that. You know why? Because God made us and he understands the best way to learning is three ways, right? And you know them well. What are they? Repetition, repetition, repetition. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and to that degree you do that is the degree that the Holy Spirit indwells you. Not literally. Not physically. Personally, actually, really, yes, just like heaven, just like heaven, just like God, God is a spirit, right? Is he physical, literal now? No. Does he actually exist? Yes. Is there a, is there a judgment seat in heaven right now? Yes. Literally, no. Physically, no. Really, yes. Actually, yes. Personally, yes. And so it is with this book. Let's look hurriedly at verse 1. This is just a teaser for next week. Something to think about, and we'll get into this discussion when we're willing next time. Watch this. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh boy. But, but that verse isn't in red in your New Testament, is it? So it must not be as important as the red letter words. <laughs> Right? Or so we're told. Paul said as he opened the book of Galatians that what he received, he didn't learn it of men. He didn't receive it that way, but he received it just like John is receiving this play. By revelation of Jesus Christ. That tells me that the black words are just as important as the red ones. The revelant, I heard that. <laughs> I don't, that's the second one. Yep. I thought we didn't hear the first one. It happened right after we spoke of it. Someone needed to tell me that. And I would have gotten into the teaser. Now I'm kind of teased because I didn't get through the teaser. All right, we'll stop there. I want to respect time.